It's when you make up your mind to do one thing that you can see how many minds you have. There's the part of the mind that goes along with that one thing. And then there are other minds that have other ideas. And it's often very tempting to go with those other minds, because you've been identifying with them. They often represent attitudes that you've had in the past that seem to work, or at least offer some entertainment value. And it's tempting to fall back in with them. This is where the Buddha's teaching on not-self is very useful. You have the right to choose whether you're going to identify with these other minds or not. Whatever shape the minds may take. Often the teaching on that self is presented as an exercise in deductive logic. But it's hard to see how that's relevant to what you're doing right now. The logic is this. Self has to be something that's permanent. You look at what you are and you're nothing but aggregates. The aggregates are impermanent, therefore there is no self. And then we're told that the reason we don't accept this is because we, don't, we refuse to be logical. We don't accept the fact that the aggregates are impermanent. And so we have to sit and watch things being impermanent until it overwhelms us that, yes, everything is impermanent and we have to let go. But it's hard to see how that teaching would be relevant to the way you're suffering. Because after all, when you cling to something as yourself, it's not necessarily the case that you cling because you think yourself is permanent. In fact, when you know something is impermanent, you tend to cling to it even more. And you fight even more strongly any possibility that it might change. And whenever you deal in deductive logic, the question always is, well, do you accept the premises? And the premises seem pretty arbitrary. But when the Buddha taught not-self, he taught with a different kind of logic, which you might call pragmatic logic. To begin with, he never defined you as five aggregates. He said the aggregates are actions or activities. They're things you do. And you create a sense of self around them. In fact, they're the raw material from which you create your sense of self. And that sense of self can be permanent or impermanent, finite, infinite. You can define it all kinds of ways. But whenever you identify with something, you're going to cling to it, and the clinging is the suffering. But at the same time, you create this sense of self. Why? Because it's a strategy for happiness. You learn that by identifying with certain things, either as the things that you will use in order to gain what you want, or that you that will enjoy it. Once you've gained it, it helps you to focus your efforts and actually get what you want. And as long as you think that it's worth the effort, you're going to continue following that particular identity. And so the Buddha's logic is to look at your identities and see where they're actually counterproductive. Here are, you're creating this sense of self as a means for finding happiness, but if it brings you suffering, is it worth it? It's a value judgment. This is the logic. It's a pragmatic logic. Now, as I said, when you're focusing on one thing like this, you begin to realize there's not just one self in there, there are lots of selves. And so a lot of the practice is sorting through them. You don't get rid of every self right away. After all, the Buddha said you're going to need a sense of self in order to do the practice, get started on the practice. 
You have to have a sense of yourself as competent, that you can do this, that you're reliable, you're responsible, you're capable. This one passage where even suggests that the reason you practice is because you love yourself. You don't want to create suffering for yourself. And if you give up on the practice, does that mean you've given up on your love for yourself? So that kind of self you don't abandon. The selves you abandon are the ones that are counterproductive, the ones that you picked up from all kinds of places. from your own trying to figure things out, and also from other people. And each of these selves has their allure, either because they promise something you want, or because there's part of you that's afraid, you feel that you have to do these things, and otherwise there's going to be trouble. So you have to sort through it, and this is why the Buddha gives those five steps for sorting through any kind of unskillful habit. You see it arise, you see it disappear. You look for the allure, you look for the drawbacks, and when you really see the allure and compare it with the drawbacks, that's when you get the escape when you let go. And so the arising of the self here would be the arising of that activity, that voice in the mind, that member of the committee, that other mind in the mind, that other self in there. You want to see when it comes, and you want to see when it goes, and then it's going to come back again. And when it comes back again, why do you go with it? What's the allure? You have to look for that. Certain voices plead with you, other voices are stern and harsh and threatening. The voices in the mind take on all kinds of tones of voice, the same way people do when dealing with one another. And that's part of the allure. So you want to see primarily whether the allure is desire or fear. And as these things get parsed out into greed, aversion, and delusion, and when you can dig down and see why a particular voice has appealed to you, what associations it has for you, the times that it's worked in the past, or at least seems to, seems to have worked. But don't let the analysis go too far into the past. Ask yourself, why am I holding on to this now? When you can see that that particular voice is not in your own interest. In other words, it doesn't fulfill the purpose of having a voice in the mind, which is to find happiness, to figure out what to do, what choices to make. Then you can throw it out of the house. We're doing some house cleaning in here, cleaning out all the unskillful selves, strengthening the skillful ones. That's one of the reasons why we do concentration practice. We're feeding the skillful voices in the mind, because they're going to have to have an allure too. And if you can associate the practice of being with a breath, with a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, a sense of strengthening what feels good inside, then those voices will have their allure. They can counteract the allure of the more unskillful ones. So the strategy here is not to just throw out your one sense of self. It's to sort through your many senses of self. Realizing that you've allowed a lot of garbage to pile up in the attic and in the closets. And 
But you have to tell yourself, you've got to move. It's like having lived in a house for many, many years. But you're going to have to move, so you've got to sort out which things are worth taking with you. If you're trying to take everything, the bill for moving is going to be really, really high. In other words, you take all the skillful and unskillful voices. The skillful voice, unskillful voices are going to drag you down. So you've got to sort them out, throw them away. There will be a sense of nostalgia, there will be a sense of this, you're throwing away part of you. This is why you really have to focus on the drawbacks. That's what the three characteristics are for. See, no matter how endearing some of these voices may be, they do cause trouble. And the more you can identify with the skillful voices inside, the easier it's going to be to throw away the unskillful ones. So focus on the voices that say, stay with the breath, the voices that tell you how to adjust the breath, how to spread the breath around, how to spread the sense of ease around. The voices that tell you to develop, to develop goodwill, the voices that tell you to contemplate the body. All the exercises that the Buddha lays out for the mind. Learn to develop some skill around them so that they have their allure. Someday, of course, you'll let them go, because you'll find something even better. But in the meantime, it's a selective letting go. So that's the logic of not-self. It's not an exercise in deductive logic. It's an exercise in pragmatic logic. You go into all the trouble of identifying with something, and if it turns on you, why keep it around? Good, plain common sense. Our problem is not so much that we refuse to listen to the Buddhist logic, it's because we don't have much common sense. We let our affections for our old identities obscure the problems that they've caused. And we've blinded ourselves to the fact that we keep creating those identities again and again and again. So meditation allows us to look at the process and see where it doesn't make any sense anymore. At the same time, giving us some things to do that do make sense, so that don't, we don't feel like we're being left adrift. Because that's the other problem with the deductive logic approach to not-self. If you feel that you're being denied of all your possibilities for the strategies of happiness, of course you're going to refuse. But if you realize not-self is there as your friend, the perception of not-self helps to clear out a lot of the ways you've been causing yourself suffering. And it's actually a good strategy for finding happiness. That's when you'll be more inclined to put it to use.